I thank you very much for those two questions. I think, um, first of all, in relation to, um, to the, the, the West Bank and the Oslo agreements and so on, I think that the, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I think um, no matter what, no matter what happens in terms of agreements, treaties, compulsion by the UN, whatever, um, the presence of, of armed people in the West Bank from the Palestinian side, a significant armed presence there, <coughs> poses a direct and immediate threat to Israel. Even if they're controlled by one side or the other, it's still a threat. And there won't be uh, even controlled, in my opinion, by the Palestinian Authority because Hamas have a very strong presence. And some polls show that if there was a, another election for president, say, in the West Bank, then Hamas would win that election hands down. And if they didn't win it, I'm sure they'd find a way of taking control anyway, as they did in Gaza. But it, but it, goes, beyond, it goes beyond even that, I think. And, and you, you just have to look around the region to imagine, I mean, it's, our, it's not our responsibility, it's our, in our interests to stop the Islamic State, to stop it from spreading, to stop it from expanding, to stop it from developing. It's in our interest as well to stop the creation of another Islamic State. What does anyone really think is going to exist in the West Bank if Israel pull out? An Islamic State, the Islamic State perhaps. Whether it's the Islamic State expanded by the current Islamic State, whether it's Iran coming in and taking over in one way or another, and Iran will not be sending their own soldiers there, but they have various proven means. After all, they took over Lebanon, for example. They're controlling much of Syria today. They're fighting in Yemen. Um, and they, uh, they, they have very, very uh, significant role in motivating and incentivizing and driving and paying Palestinian terrorists to attack Israel. And if it isn't them, it'll be some other jihadists. The Islamic State may end as we know it. It may end tomorrow. Let's not forget what the Islamic State is. It's just an evolution of Al-Qaeda. It, it is made up, effectively, the Islamic State is made up of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and some of Saddam's military commanders. That's what it is, with lots of increments added to it. So it'll, it'll change and evolve into different things as time goes on. But one, one way or another, one of these groups will seize control or will, not, even if they don't seize control, they will turn it into a, a conflict area which will threaten Israel. So how can Israel leave? Um, uh, uh, the US got a, a general, a retired general, to do a study of um, how the West Bank would be controlled uh, in security terms if Israel withdrew. And he talked about technology, he talked about international forces, etc. cetera. Um, no. I can assure you, I mean, nothing, none of that, you cannot rely on technology to, to look after the interests of the lives of your people if you're a prime minister. And realistically, could an Israeli prime minister be expected to depend on an international force? We just have to look at what international forces have done in that region and other regions in the world. I've spent quite a lot of time serving with the United Nations in different places. Certainly, you couldn't depend upon a UN force. So the general that recommended that, that advised President Obama to put forward that plan, would not, I guarantee you, if the same situation had been present in the US and he was advising his president on how to protect the United States, there wouldn't have been that plan or any other plan apart from involving US forces. So I think, I don't, you know, it's very bleak. This is a very bleak thing to say, I believe, but... I cannot for you know the 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 the, the, uh, the Arab world is not going to change dramatically in our lifetimes. It, it might change for the worse, if anything. It's not going to change for the better in terms of its hostility to the Jewish state. Yes, there are signs of progress uh, with Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, other Gulf states in their relationship with Egypt, but this is purely tactical, it's purely self-interest, only, it only will continue while they need, in some way, Israel. Ultimately, they will all remain hostile to Israel. Israel cannot possibly surrender its security um, 
to anybody else apart from itself. And, and, and I do not believe it will ever be, there will ever be a time when it can give up a military presence in the West Bank. I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but that's the way it is, in my opinion. And even we spoke about, some of us spoke about um, a uh, developing Gaza from being uh, basically, in some ways, a, a state under siege brought about by the Hamas government to giving it a, a form of harbour, seaport, possibly offshore airport that could use it. Now, all of that is going to help. Of course, it's going to help to reduce conflict. Of course it is, because it will bring up the way of life, bring up the quality of life of the Gazans. Um, but it's not going to change the fundamental nature of the conflict in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians, I'm afraid. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it because it's a really excellent initiative and it should be done. But um, it's not, nothing is the answer to this problem. I'm afraid, I mean, I, will, I, I hate to say this, I hate to say this, but I'm afraid, in my opinion, this is true, that the fact there is a problem does not mean there is a solution. Sorry. What was your second question? Oh, yes, PTA, the, the, the ability of the... Yeah, the, the, the other question is the ability of uh, Israel to continue putting up a hard fight against this with the, um, you know, the, 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 the impact it has psychologically on the residents of, of the country. I think that's the key issue. I, I was, I've been there frequently in the last few years, including during the periods of the conflicts in Gaza, during the, the time, the high points of the, of the knife attacks, the ramming, the stabbings, those sort of things, um, and at times of other terrorist attacks. And I have been incredibly impressed by the resilience of the Israeli people. And it's a resilience to an extent borne by the, the, their recognition of the state they're in. They're not in Norway. They're not in Surrey in Britain. They are in a country where they're surrounded by enemies. Only on one side are there no enemies, and that's the Mediterranean Sea. And they can come from there as well, but uh, it's relatively secure. So they, they have this innate strength given to them partly by um, the circumstance they're in. But also, I think, um, I think given to them by um, what I described earlier as the miracle of the creation of, of, the, of the Jewish state, which it was a miracle, and it remains a miracle. And the way that it's been attacked, the way that it was attacked when it came into birth in 1948 by five Arab armies and managed to fight, fight them off. The way it's been consistently attacked by conventional and terrorist attacks and fight them off, that has to be a miracle. And I think that whether they're religious or not, individuals there, I think, are conscious of... Not, I'm not speaking for every Israeli, but I think the impression I have is that many, many of them are conscious of this. And, and Israel actually, um, strange, to, strange to say, uh, I think a recent survey last year, despite all the problems Israel has and its circumstances in the Middle East, uh, was described, I think it was found in a survey to be one of the top three happiest countries in the world. So I think that speaks for the resilience of the Israeli people. And when they, I, I, was, I was in Tel Aviv um, a couple of months ago when there was a, a terrorist attack in a cafe uh, in, in, the, in the city. And... I went to that cafe the next day. A number of people were killed there. I went to the cafe the next day. It was as though it had, nothing had happened. It, was open, it had been cleaned up overnight. Everything, all the, poli the police had been in, dealt with the scene, done the forensic testing, all the rest of it. Cleaned up, opened for business, buzzing, full of happy, maybe in their head still what happened, but nevertheless... It was, it was as before. The only way you could tell anything had happened there was because just across the road, uh, just across the way, there was a place where flowers were being laid um, to, uh, to commemorate the, the victims. So I, and, and that's, I think that you know, all, all of this speaks to the resilience of the Israeli people. I personally, I'm not complacent about this, but I don't have the, the same kind of concerns as I might have if this intensity of attack occurred in a country like the UK. And, and another thing I think you can attribute the resilience to, and I would say this, I think, as a, a professional soldier, is that every single person in Israel has been a soldier. 
And that's, that's, that's more than it might sound. I mean, I know many of you here have been soldiers, and you therefore know um, that military training and experience gives you maybe a slightly different perspective and a different form of strength. Not everybody. We suffer. Many of us suffer from PTSD as well. But I think, it, you know, collectively, I think that adds to the strength of the state of Israel.